Good. Right on, me too. I'm a little hot. I'm out of breath. That's okay. So, tonight, I'm going to be talking about patience. And uh, this was, I don't know, maybe like a month ago. I was just thinking, like, what my next topic might be. And then, I forget where I saw it, but I saw the word patience, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I started to, you know, like, look it up and really get into it and everything. And I was, I mean, I was having, like, a lot of fun putting this this sermon message together because it was, uh, what's the good word for it? Well, I mean, every time I do something, it's always, it's always I get something out of it. But this one was was really encouraging for me because I could see the growth in myself, which was really reassuring. And uh, I think a lot of times when we think about patience, we don't think about how impatient we are. And we live in a society that is literally made off of our impatience. Uh, There's fast food, there's microwaves, there's faster cable, there's faster TV, there's faster this, faster that, get it now, hurry up. All this kind of stuff to take away from you putting in effort to get the results that you want. There's always some type of workaround that's offered. Um, And how many know a lot of times, almost 99% of the time they don't work. Um, And so I looked up patients and I found two definitions that I really liked. Um, The first one is, it's kind of wordy, so I'll repeat it a couple times. The bearing of provocation, annoyance, misfortune, or pain without complaint, loss of temper, irritation, or the like. One more time. The bearing of provocation, annoyance, misfortune, or pain without complaint, loss of temper, irritation, or the like. And the second definition is quiet, steady perseverance, even-tempered care, and diligence. And I was like, Ugh, I'm not patient in anything. And this is, I mean, we, when I look at patience, to me, both spiritually and naturally, that's a sign of maturity. Because kids are the most impatient beings there are. Like, they immediately want it now. They think you can get it now. Like if they say, I want a bicycle, you're going to pull one out of the closet and give it to them. And a lot of us don't grow out of that. We get older, but we keep the same mentality. And we carry it with us in everything we do. And that impatience leads to you get upset, you get discouraged, you get disappointed all kinds of negative side effects of being impatient. And I started to look in the word and see like what the Bible has to say about patience. And not only what does it have to say, but like what are the benefits of it, right? Because how many know God doesn't command stuff to, for us to do without there being some benefit for us, right? It's not like he ever commands us to do anything just because, or just because he wants to, or something like, you know what I mean? It's always to our benefit. A lot of times we don't see that, though, because we just look at the work we have to do and think about how it's going to inconvenience us. We don't see the end result because we don't read the whole scripture. We read the part, as soon as we hear, you got to do this much work, we're like, that's it. Next scripture. Find me one that's nice, right? Because, I mean, I've done that before, and it's funny because pastor, when I get, when I see pastor's notes, or even when he goes through the scriptures up here, a lot of times he doesn't read through all of them because the Spirit's taking him somewhere else. If you read through the rest of the scripture, and even the rest of the book that that scripture is from, you can see that there's stuff before and after that make that scripture make more sense. And we don't ever look at that. We think just because it's sectioned off that that's, it's a one and done statement. It's not true. Go to, go, turn your Bible to Isaiah 40, 31. I think we should all know this scripture, or we, we've at least all heard it, but we haven't really thought about it. It says, but those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagles, mount up to the sun, 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. Right there it says, if you're patient in God, he renews your strength. I mean, that's like one benefit we hear right off the bat. And we think, okay, great, cool. I can be patient in God. But we confuse patience in God for being passive in God. And that's where the problem lies. That's why your strength's not getting renewed. And that's why you're like, well, what the heck, man? Why are they lying to me? I'm sitting here patiently. Yeah, okay. Here's the thing. If you're in line for anything, right? And the next person in front of you moves up, but you don't move, are you going to get any closer to the front of the line? And if you say, I'm just being patient for the, to get to the front of the line, all you're doing is standing there doing nothing. So you're not getting where you want to go, and now everyone else behind you doesn't get to go where they want to go. But we don't look at it like that. We look at it as, why can't the front of the line come to me? I've been here patiently waiting, right? It's, we have it so backwards. We're so selfish. And it's, it, I don't know. I'm someone who really likes to give to other people and help other people. And even I'm selfish. And I think I'm the most giving person there is. I think I would be like, yo, man, call me anytime. I'm there. And then sometimes I'm like, ah, you know? Like I, and I'm like, I excuse it as, oh, it's, I know who it is. I can tell them no. I, no, I'm wrong for that. But we try and play it off, and we try and make excuses for ourselves. And we always have a justification. And when it comes to God, your justification is never good enough. That's as plain and simple as it is. Even the truth isn't a good enough excuse. I don't care what, if you're late for something and you say, well, it's because I hit every red light, that may be true, but why didn't you take into account that you may hit every red light on the way there? I don't care if you hit every red light. If you said you were going to be there at a certain time, prepare for everything that could stop you from getting there at that certain time. But we don't do that because we don't prepare during our patience. We don't prepare while we're waiting on God to move. That's what we always forget. We don't do what we're supposed to do. We think we can pray to God and then wait for him to take care of it and do absolutely nothing. And that is not true. That is the absolute opposite of what we're supposed to do. Um, turn your Bibles to Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. This kind of goes right with Isaiah 40, 31. And it goes a little more in depth and kind of help us see what we're supposed to do. It says, therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us, and let us run with patience, ind patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us. Before I go on, it says right there, let us run with patient endurance. That means you have to be moving. It says with steady and active pers persistence. That means you're not inactive. You're, not, you're doing something. You're doing what you're supposed to do. You're getting in your word. You're praying more. You're being of service to someone else. You're doing what God's called you to do so that he can move in your life. Because if you're not where you're supposed to be so God can bless you, you're never going to get the blessings that he has for you. And he wants to give them to you. He really does. It's not like he's like dangling a carrot in front of you just to keep you running forward. Like, if you get to the point where you get the carrot, you get the carrot, and then you get the next carrot. The problem is, we don't ever keep moving forward. We just stop, we just give up. And it's, it's funny, because we prefer giving up over just sticking it out. I did uh, a mud run on like two, last Saturday or something. First one I've ever done, All right? It was heck of funny because I was with Ray, and I was like, yeah, Ray, we'll stick together, right? We'll finish it together, help each other out on the obstacles, all this kind of stuff, right? He was gone in like five minutes, and he's like looking back, and I was like, no, just go without me. It's okay. I don't want to hold you back. Just go. I'll, I'll finish. I'll get there. It took me like 15 minutes longer, but I did it, but I told myself, I was like, you know what? My goal wasn't like to finish first because that's stupid. It's the first one I've ever done. That's, there's no way. I'm not fit enough to be doing that. I started at the back of the group anyways, so 
There's no way I was gonna be able to get to the front. But I was like, you know, I'm gonna finish. That's all I care about. The very like last obstacle was you have to like run up one of those curved walls, right? <laughs> oh my God, the first time I went up, it was so funny because you're supposed to kind of jump at the end and I forgot. So I just like was running and then all of a sudden it starts curving and I was like going backwards. I was like, oh my God, and I like fell down. And there was like a bunch of people in line and I was like, God, that's embarrassing. And I was like, you know what? I don't care. And they have stairs to the side, so you can just like quit. And I was like, nah, I'm getting up that wall. I don't care how long it takes. I got on the second try though, but thank you. But I was, I was really, I was like, as I was doing the whole thing, I was like, just telling myself one step at a time, one obstacle at a time, right? Like, and that was what, it actually made it really fun because then I started counting them down. I was like, oh, sweet, 10 more to go, nine more to go, All right? And I would get to watch other people and there was like this one guy who had just given up. And it was so funny because he literally gave up at the halfway point, halfway through an obstacle. It was like this tunnel you're supposed to crawl under and it's an L and he was sitting in the corner. He, and I didn't even know him. I'm just crawling through. He's like, I can't do it, bro. And I was like, okay, first of all, why are you telling me? Second of all, I was like, yes, you can. I was like, come on, you can do it, right? And I'm sitting in the dark in the mud with this dude trying to tell him, come on, man, you can do it, right? He didn't want to listen to me. I tried like three times. I was like, forget it. You don't, I was like, okay, you can't. And I just kept going. Because I was like, but see, here's the thing. How many of us get caught up with someone else, right? We think we have to sit there and help them out. If they don't want to do it, then keep going. I don't, I don't understand that. Like, and you can't think, oh, I'm being mean. No, they're being unmotivated. They're being lazy. They're being whatever, okay? Like, you tried. They didn't want it, so keep going, right? And we think, oh, let me be patient with them, right? I mean, how many of us get in relationships and you guys, like, you know, there's something that your partner does that you don't like, right? And you try and talk to them about it or something, and then they don't ever do nothing about it. You're like, I'm just gonna be patient. 30 years down the line, they're still doing the same thing. <laughs> like you, sorry, you were patient for the wrong thing. Let me just say that. Because they're, you thinking that you're helping them out is holding you back. Because you're now trying to live their life for them. And we can't ever do that. We, we're not called to live someone else's life. We're called to live our lives. If we were called to live someone else's life, God would have only ever made one person because then there'd be no other person for that, for him to have to deal with. Like he wouldn't have to worry about anyone else's life, just his. He didn't do that because he called us all with a purpose. We all have our own calling, our own place to be. And if we do nothing, if we sit by and do nothing and, or we get stuck with someone else or anything that causes us to stop moving forward, we're not living the life we're supposed to live. We're not living the life we're called to live. And go to, go to Rome, or sorry, go to James 5, 7 through 11. This was like, I mean, like I said, I was having like a lot of fun putting this together because I was like, dude, I get this. Like, I see myself doing it. And what was cool was like, it's not, no one explicitly told me what I wrote down, but I knew that I've learned it and I've heard it before and that it's been taught to me. And it was just cool to see it like happening in my life. But the thing is, it wasn't gonna happen in my life unless I applied it, which made me proud of myself that I was applying it. Cause I was like, okay, I'm doing something right. And I mean, that's like a good feeling. Like you ever realize you're doing something right and you can see that you're doing something right? It feels good. And let me tell you, like when you are serving God and when he is like active in your life and you are actively participating in the life he's called you to live, it's amazing. I mean, there is joy that comes with it. There's blessings that come with it. But all that kind of, all that stuff is just nothing to like, just the kind of like peace you have. And it's, I don't know. I just, I look at a lot of people. I look at the world and I see just how much people are unpeaceful or how much peace people don't have. And 
I don't, I don't think, ha, 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 I got peace, you don't. No, I look at them and I'm like, dang, I want you to have what I have. But you're never going to have that thought unless you're where you're supposed to be with God. Unless you're waiting on God, unless you're actively participating in your spiritual development and your spiritual growth. You're never going to have that thought because all you're going to be worried about is why nothing's going right for you. Because when you're serving God, you don't worry about what's not going right for you because you don't see anything is not going right for you. That's the kind of thing that we don't get. Like, I mean, yes, you will see things like, God, that sucks. Oh, it's the worst thing ever. Why is this happening? All, but you don't, if you trust God, you don't worry about it. Those thoughts run through your head, but you don't live by those thoughts because you know the truth and you live by the truth. And the truth is, is going to overpower those thoughts. But if you're not constantly reminding yourself of the truth by reading the word, by praying, by getting in his word in fellowship and worship and pray, and all that kind of stuff, you're never going to have that inside. You're never going to let that, uh, the opportunity for the truth to take over in your life. And we think it's so hard. We really do. Like, we think it's like, oh, I got to do it all at once. You really don't. Like, if praise is your thing, get into praise and worship. If you really like reading, get into the Bible. Tear it apart. Rip it. Like, look at the scripture. I mean, you can get a Bible that has references to other scriptures, so it's not even like you have to sit and read it from beginning to end. Like, you can read, like, five scriptures, and then they'll, like, reference another one in, like, 16 chapters away, and you're like, oh, cool, right? Like, I mean, how many of us, well, I guess I'm more talking to youth, but, like, you ever, like, have to, like, read something and for, like, history or something, and you wish they would, like, have little side notes? Like, remember when we read about this six chapters ago? And then your teacher says, and you're like, I don't remember that. That was honestly six months ago. You expect me to remember that, right? Well, okay, some Bibles do that for you. So get one of those, okay, because it's nice. It reminds you of what you already read. It, and it helps you see how the Bible is connected and it's all, everything is linked together. It's not just like one saying over here, one scripture over here, and then we in our heads make it make sense. No, okay, because there's been people that have tried to like take this book apart and find loopholes and they can't. There's been people that are like trying to disprove God and they end up believing in God because they see the truth in it. Because they do what believers don't do and they get in and they break everything down and they look into everything and they find the connections and they find what they think might be disconnections and they find out that, oh my God, everything in there is true. Everything in there is, is there's no denying it. And I think, I think that's awesome. And it gives me more courage and or encouragement to read the Bible because I'm like, you know what, if it can persuade someone who didn't, who claimed they didn't believe in God that God exists, then me who claims to believe in God should have no, absolutely no problem or no doubt reading that word and trusting it. But we do all the time because we look at it through our perspective, through someone else's perspective, through the, through the perspective of hurt, through the perspective of whatever it is, anything but our spiritual, our, our spirit. We, that's like, that's the key to understanding the Bible is you gotta, you gotta read it with your spirit. You can't just like read it with your eyes and then be like, I'm saved. It doesn't work like that, trust me. Because when I was in Chosen Church, we had a thing that was like, read the Bible in a year, right? And I tried and I quit because I was like, this, it wasn't making any sense because I was reading it as, okay, today I have to read these six chapters. I was looking at it as homework or whatever. And I was like, and I, on it, I remember when I read it, because I can read stuff and like comprehend it, but like not, and just tell you what I read, but actually not have gotten anything out of it. And I remember I would read it. I was just, okay, done for the day. Like I didn't get into it. That's what the point of it was, was to get into it. I didn't get into it. I just read it. And then I, then I gave up because I was like, this is taken out of time of whatever else I want to do, which at the time was absolutely nothing. So that showed you my priorities at the moment. But anyways, James 5, 7 through 11, it says, So be patient, brethren, as you wait till the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits expectantly for the precious harvest from the land. See how he keeps up his patient vigil over it until it receives the early and late rains. How many know when, I mean, none of us are farmers, I don't think. If you are, cool. That'd be tight if I could do that. I can't. But you know you have to plant the seed, then you have to water it, 
but you can't like do anything else after that, right? You kind of have to let the plant grow on its own, right? Okay, but you can't just throw a seed on the ground and then be like, tree. Like, that doesn't happen. You have to do something, right? And the Bible uses like metaphors and parables and stuff to, of stuff that we do on earth to help us understand. And sometimes we just disregard it because the Bible's written a long time ago, right? And like they used to farm all the time. Now we have machines doing it. But if you think about it, if the farmer does too much, if he messes too much with the seed, the seed's never gonna grow because there's too much outside interference. If he does too little, the seed's never gonna grow because he didn't cultivate it enough. He didn't put in his 50% of work, right? So you have to apply that to your spiritual life, to your walk with God. You have to read the word. You have to pray. You have to get into praise and worship. You can't just say, I'm a believer, and then God is gonna take care of your life. You, you have to put in the necessary work and you can't put in too much work and start meddling with what God's trying to do because that's the other thing we do. We get impatient, so we're like, you know what, screw it, you're taking too long. I'm taking over. How many of us have ever made something in the microwave and then be like, it's like three minutes and when it gets like past two minutes, you're like, forget it, that's good enough. You take it out and you try and eat it, the middle's cold, right? I do that all the time. Well, I used to. We don't really have like frozen stuff anymore. Anyways, but... I used, like, that was me. Like, Hot Pockets, I only ever ate the ends because, like, the middle was always still heck of cold. Like, I mean, like, frozen, frozen. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense because this end is molten hot. This end is Antarctica. How? Right? It's because I was impatient. Or, like, you ever bake cookies and you're like, you know what? It says seven minutes, but if I double the temperature, I can do half the time. Right? We start getting logical. We start making reasonings. Like, all of a sudden, we're smart when we're trying to get stuff done faster. We get really, really smart and educated when we're trying to do stuff that's going to, like, help us do whatever we want to do. When we get really selfish, we get really smart. I think that's funny. Like, kids, when they really, really want to do something, they're, like, the, the, the smallest geniuses you'll ever see. Like, if they really want a cookie, they will, like, work the system to get that cookie. And it's like a cookie. And he's like, you serious? Like, why don't you apply that effort to cleaning your room? Right? Like, parents say that all the time. Kids are never going to understand it. You're wasting your time. Just teach them how to clean their room. Don't try and say whatever. Anyways, but we get impatient. We start trying to do God's work for him. And you know what? Moses did that. He got impatient. He got restless. And you, you know what's funny is God gave him so many chances. God gives us grace and exercises patience with us and we don't even recognize it. We, don't, we take it for granted so much. It's like, we look at it and we're like, you know what, God loves me anyways, I can do what I want. That's so disrespectful. I mean, come on. And we, can't, I, don't, I don't know why we don't look at that and think like, oh, I'm being so mean and he still loves you anyways. Like, to me, that gives me more reason to pay more attention to how selfish I am, to how impatient I am because I don't want to do that to the creator of heaven and earth that saved my life, that is guiding me to a successful, prosperous life, and that can do that for other people, and that I want to see him do that for other people. I can't live a selfish life if I want that for other people. And if you don't want what you have for other people, then you are living a selfish life. Christian life. And that's all there is to it. And there's no excuse that you, at least that you can give me that I'm going to say, okay, fine. Yeah, you can be selfish today. Because when you get filled with the love of God, when you feel God's love, you can't help but want someone else to feel that. It's like when you, I don't know, it, experience like the, mo you go to a movie and it's like the most amazing movie you've ever seen. Like you'll recommend it to everyone even if they don't like the movie. You're like, oh my God, you have to see it, right? Like I try that with pastor, it never works because <laughs> me and him, like there's like maybe one time we'll agree on a movie, but I'm like, pastor, you have to see it. It's so good. Meh. He's like, meh, it's fine. And he'll tell me, he's like, oh, Freddie, 
classic. And I'm like, all right. And I watch it, I'm like, no, it's not. Because <laughs> it just doesn't, right? But with God, it does happen. With God, it's like, oh my God, pastor. And he's like, I know, right? Like it's, because we both have that, we've had that, that experience with God that, that we know what we're talking about. Or any other person, it doesn't even have to just be pastors, any other person that's had an experience with God, that experienced the love of God, they know what you're talking about instinctively. And there's, it's so hard to describe, but it's just like one of those things you just know. Like, it's, I don't know, it's just cool. To me, that's cool. Like, I don't even want to try and explain it. It's just amazing. And we are examples of God's love when we exercise patience. And we have to understand, we have to exercise patience with not only people outside of the church, but especially people inside the church. Because anyone that walks through these doors and sees us being impatient with each other is gonna walk right back out. Because they're like, you know what? I can get that in line at McDonald's. <laughs> Why do I need to come to church and have them tell me how I can change my life? And all, right? They're gonna have walls up immediately. And if we're treating each other like we can't stand to be 10 feet from each other, how are they gonna want what we have? They're not. In first Peter, no, first John four, seven through eight, it talks about that. And that was what when I was putting this message together, I was most excited about was to see how patience can impact someone else's life. Because like when I see someone who's really patient with someone, to me, I just like want to sit and watch that person handle every situation. Like when I worked at Target and I was like customer service, I was, I was like kind of false patience. Like I would pretend to be patient with the people and then just like get irritated afterwards. But like they'd sit there, they'd yell at me about how they wanted to do this and that. And I was like, okay, cool. Nice, right on. Glad you have that opinion not going to do it for you. Like, I wasn't nice. I would pretend to be patient with them, and then I would just be rude. But when I see someone who has patience handle and diffuse the situation, that the other person who's, like, upset or whatever is, like, they start, like, disproving themselves in their argument. They start trying to, like, get and bait that person in any way involved, and that person isn't giving in. They start to, like, tear down their own argument that they were trying to make and it's to me it's like amazing to watch I'm like that is tight like if I was a lawyer that's what I would want to do I'd like ask the defendant a question and then just like let them try and explain and then like let them you know like prosecute themselves and indict themselves and I'd be like case closed like that would be like my catchphrase case closed but if if we really really want to be true representatives of God we have to exercise patience because in the Bible, it says, the very first thing it says love is, it says love is patient. And when I look at the Bible, I don't think of it as they just put it in a random order. they just like, oh, that sounds good, and then this sounds good. It's in there for a reason. It's in that order for a reason. Because you can't love someone unless you're patient with them. Because if you're not patient with them, you're not going to listen to what they say. You're not going to listen to reason, you're going to disregard them, you're going to think they're this and that, worthless, you know, not wasting your time, all this kind of stuff that you're not going to give them the respect that they deserve or need or whatever to show them love. And if we want to show the world God's love, we have to be patient. We have to exercise patience and show patience. We can't be quick to judge. We can't be quick to ridicule, to lash out, to defend ourselves when we think we've been offended or when someone's attacking us. Because that's where I think Christians fall short the most, is when we claim we're Christians and then people come against, against us, we feel we have to defend ourselves. And we feel we have to defend God. Like, no, you don't. I'm pretty sure God could defend himself just fine. doesn't need you. Because honestly, how much good are you really doing? I mean, if, if God needed us to defend him, we wouldn't ever need God you understand that? That would make us stronger than God. Because the person who defends you is the person who's stronger than you. That's why we have a military that employs like people like Jerome. You know what I'm saying? 
Like, you don't want me defending the country. You want Jerome defending the country. <laughs> There's a reason, and we, we think it's just like, oh, uh, you know, it's just like a macho thing. Like, no, dude, like, you need, you need a strong person to defend you. You don't ask your smaller friend, hey, go fight this person for me. He was talking mess. Like, no, like, I go, like, that's why younger brothers ask their older brothers, not the other way around. You know what I'm saying? Or kids go to their parents. Like, you go to someone who's stronger than you. And if we think we have to defend God, we're saying, God, you're weaker than I am. And ooh, I don't want to say that. To me, that sounds like a challenge. If I was God, I'd be like, oh, yeah, bam, <laughs> dead. And then I bring you back to life, bam, kill you again. Like, who's stronger now, fool? No, no, I'm never going to do that. I never want to do that. That is such... That is playing with fire, if there ever was playing with fire. And <laughs> I just, oh, that's what I'm saying. When I was doing this, I was like, this is tight. Like, this is so cool. Like, everything was just like, I couldn't write it down fast. I actually had to write my notes because, like, usually I'll type them and just read them off my phone. And I was like, no, I got to write it. And there were so many misspellings. I missed, like, 15 words in one sentence. I tried to read it back to myself. And it was literally, like, the and then, like, God. And I was like, I thought I wrote a lot more than that. And I was like, I don't even know what point I was trying to make. And, but it was, it was so exciting for me to like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And it was like, I could see how much I've grown in patience. And I could also actually see how much other people have grown in patience, which was really cool. Because then I was like, you know what? Someone's getting it. And if more than one person gets it, that's all it takes. Because... One person is just an opinion. Two people is like a movement. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you have someone else who's backing you up, like, it all of a sudden gives you credibility. If you're just one person saying it, someone's like, eh, it sounds like you're just talking. But if someone else is saying it as well, you're like, you know what, now I have to listen. And to me, when the church gets together like that, when the church gets it and is all saying the same thing, that's when God can move. That's when God can change people's lives. That's when God can impact people. And that's what we're called to do is impact the world. But what we do is we listen to the two people in the world and what they're saying. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it goes both ways. We can be just as impactful, but instead we're just sitting by waiting for God to fix them instead of getting ourselves right so we can be examples to them because they're waiting for us to get fixed. So they can be like, you know what? He's got it together. She's got it together. I want what he has. I want what she has. And if we just sit by and do nothing, that's never going to happen. We're never going to be able to grow. We're never going to be able to impact anyone. And I think if you come here, I don't think you can leave and not want to impact someone. Because that's what this church is about, is impacting people and changing lives. And if you've been here for any length of time, whether you know it or not, that's what's in the back of your head. That's what's motivating your walk with God is you want to impact someone else. You want someone else to have what you have because you understand the love of God and you understand like how he can change, like really, I mean like change, change your life because we've all needed him at some point and, if he, and when he's come through, we, there's no denying it. I mean, there was, I was, I don't remember how old I was. I was like eight or nine or something. And there was youth, a youth service going on in the other building. And I went over there, and I was just sitting. I had no idea I was crying. Like, they were doing praise and worship. I was, like, bawling. I had no idea. I thought I was just sitting there. My dad came over to me. He was like, what's wrong? I was like, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean what's wrong? He's like, you're crying. I was like, no, I'm not. I am. Right? And then I was, like, all, and then I was like all into praise and worship, but I... When he brought it to my attention, I was like, holy crap. Like, the presence of God. And I was like, dang, I was eight. And then from that moment on, like, even when I've tried to deny the active hand of God in my life, that thought comes back in my head. That moment comes back in my head. Or another moment when we were on vacation in Yosemite, I was walking on a bridge that was really watery because it was like right by a waterfall and I slipped 
I went right towards the edge. I kid you not, I was going to go under. I saw a hand come down and do this, felt it, and it slowed me down, and I went to the edge and went like this to the edge. I was like, Wee! like that. And I was like, and I have the tenacity to stand here and try and deny God. That's why I said I don't play with that I'm stronger than God is. Because even when I wasn't taking a conscious effort in my spiritual walk, he was taking a conscious effort in me. Because he was patient with me. He's patient with each and every one of us. And we, the best way that we can show him love is to reciprocate what he's done for us. And that's how we can be the best examples of God ever, is to do what he said. I mean, the Bible says, follow me as I follow Christ, right? If there is no me to follow, then just follow Christ. Make yourself the me. If you don't have anyone that you can look at that's following Christ, then be the person that's following Christ that someone else can look at. Because maybe that's what you're called to be. Maybe you're, maybe you're the person that someone else needs. We spend so long, trying to, like I said, trying to get someone else to do it for us instead of being like, you know what, forget it. No one wants to help me, help myself. I need God. God, where are you? Get a hold of God. Get in your word. Start. I, I say it all the time, and it's because that's really the only answer there is, is you have to participate in your spiritual walk. You can't sit by and do nothing. You can't say, I'm being patient on God. No, you're not. You're being lazy. You're being, dis you're being, you're honestly being disrespectful. He's saying, come on, let's go. And you're like, nah, I'll just wait till you take care of it. It's, I mean, how many of us have kids? I'll take my hand down, but raise your hand if you have kids. <laughs> I don't have kids yet in the future. Um, and how many times do you try to get your kids to do something? And they never do it, Right? But if you're just standing there saying, do this, do this, do this, you're not showing them what they're supposed to do. How are they ever going to know what they're supposed to do? You can't just say, you can't just Hitler them around the house. You have to, you have to set the tone. You have to set the example. That's what we have to do as Christians is set the example for the world. We can't say, no, don't do this, don't do that but then live a life that's completely contradictory to what we're saying. Or live the same life they're living. They're like, I can tell you the same thing. God wants us to learn how to love one another and learn how to love people. Because it says, love covers a multitude of sins. It all comes back to God's love. And if we are to be the greatest examples we can be of God's love. It's to learn how to be patient. And your patience will give you everlasting life because it says that your prize isn't here. It's waiting for you in heaven. If you stay faithful to the race, if you endure to the end, that's what we should be, that's what we should be working towards. That's what we should be living towards is not what we can get here. It's how much we can give here to someone else who has nothing or who doesn't have what we have so that we can get our greater reward later. And you know what is even cooler? He doesn't tell us like specifically what the greater reward is. He just says a greater reward, which means it's gonna be like a big surprise, right? Well, like if you only do like a little bit, it's gonna be a little surprise. Well, that's not true, but I mean, it's just, if it helps you look at it that way, look at it that way. Like the more you do here, the more fun you get to have, right? I mean, that to me is what I focus on in my walk with God or my relationship with God and how I approach it with other people is I can't let my judgments or insecurities or anything get in the way of them getting to God. I can't be the person in line that, expect, that expects the front of the line to come to me. You know what I mean? Like I have to keep moving forward so other people can keep moving forward. And I think we all know it and we all really want to we try really hard, but we give up too easily because we look at it, we look at that, the, alter, the alternative being continue trying or give up. 
we look at giving up as the easier thing to do. When honestly, we forget that we're not trying on our own. God provides a way for you to get through what it is you have to get through. But you have to trust in him. You have to rely on him. You have to be patient in him by doing what you're supposed to do, what he's called you to do. And he makes the way for you. He clears the path so that you can keep walking. I'm not saying it's gonna be like walking on clouds, but it's not like he sends you to climb a mountain barefooted. You know what I'm saying? Like he gives you everything you need to get through it, to get over it. To, and, and not only that, but you come through it successfully and you come through it as an example to other people. You come through it so that he can show you off and be like, look, Look, if they can do it, you can do it. And me always wanting to be like, I always volunteer, you know, like I want to volunteer. I want to be the example, da, 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 da. To me, that's like sweet. That's right up my alley. It's way less work. I get to volunteer and then I get everything I need. I don't have to like try and figure it out on my own. And to me, that gives me joy and that gives me comfort in my walk with God. And it just helps straight, like, we, don't, we, we have to understand that it builds on itself. It's like, I mean, it's like a circle. You trust in God, he rewards your faith, you succeed, you wanna trust him more. He rewards you more, you succeed more. You're like, I wanna do this even more and it just builds and builds and builds. But we get sidetracked with paying attention to what other people are doing, to the success of other people, or to what other people are doing wrong because we want to be like, well, look what they're doing. Like, we want to start pointing fingers. Patience. Everyone will get it in their own time. Every one of us is going to get it at our own pace. But the key is we have to keep running together. We can't just quit because one other person quits. We can't just stop because someone else stops or whatever. Like, that's why I told Ray to keep going because I was like, yeah. You're, fat, you're obviously more equipped for this than me. I'm not gonna hold you back. I'm not gonna ask you to stay back here with me because I wasn't prepared to do this. You see what I'm saying? We're so selfish, we're like, I'm not prepared, you have to not be prepared too. I watched a movie last night. This guy, his, he, he was like young, he was like in his mid-20s, he was married really young, but he, his, him and his wife separated and then his friends were like, all right, we'll be single with you. We'll make a pact. And then each one of them like finds like a new relationship and then they try and like hide it from their friends. And I was like, you idiot. I was like, what are you doing? I was like, sorry, bro. I know we said we were gonna be single, but check it out. Here's the deal. She's into me, I'm into her. It's going down. We're a thing now. So nah, you know what? I'll help you out. You know what? I'll get you a date. I'll send you over to her friend. Right? I was like, they just wanted to be lonely and sad together. I was like, what is this? I mean, I watched the whole thing hoping they would like learn something and they didn't. They didn't learn anything. I was like, pointless. I was so disappointed. And I was up to like five in the morning too. I know. I was really hoping something else was going to happen, but nothing did. But the point is, don't let your patience become passiveness. And remember that patience doesn't mean you're not doing anything. It means you're waiting for the door to open so you can walk through it, but you're prepared to walk through the door. You guys ever been excited to go on a date? That person says they'll pick you up at 7.30. Do you get ready at 7.25? No, you get ready at 2.30. <laughs> and, you, and you wait by the front door for four hours, and then they call you at eight o'clock. Hey, I'm just leaving. That's okay. That's okay. I was, I was just finishing getting ready too. Heck no. You were waiting there heck along, but we don't take that approach with God. We have to. We have to. We have to be ready for God to say, here's the door, now go through it, and then go through the door. Amen? Yeah. Thank you.